Right, so we're in week two of this short series called Back by Popular Demand. So what we're doing over the course of the next uh, several weeks is just going back into our uh, you know, archives, I guess you would say, and pulling out some of the messages of the past that have proven to be you know, really popular, whether that's been on YouTube or just by request, people talking about them and just saying, hey, I'd like to hear that message again, or I've heard other people talking about that message and I wasn't here at that time. And so uh, we're doing that over the next few weeks, just going back and just uh, enjoying some of these messages of the past all over again. Listen, God's Word never changes, and uh, you know if it was good enough to preach the first time, it's good enough to do it again. So that's the whole sort of uh, premise for this particular series. And so I started off last week with a message from a series uh, way back when. I think it was uh, back in, I want to say 2015, called Elijah, Elisha. And this is the most popular message that we have on YouTube with over 35,000 views called Making a Man of God or a Woman of God, just whichever you happen to be. If you missed last week, go back and watch that. Either the one we preached last week or the one we preached years ago, uh, they're pretty much the same, both really good messages. And uh, speaking of that particular series, out of all of them of the past, it, it's interesting that here in this four-week series, we have two messages from the Elijah Elisha series. So that tells you that that particular series was a really good one. So next week, I'll be talking about uh, not Elijah, but his uh, protege, Elisha, with a message called Crazy Commitment. It's about uh, Elijah's call, or Elisha's call to the ministry and his radical response to the call of God on his life. And so you don't want to miss that next week. But today, uh, we're reaching again back into the archives by request from a series that we did back in 2011. And I was sort of surprised people would remember back that far. Uh, so this one must have had a really big impact on the person that requested it. But it was from a series called Tongue Pierced. And that, that particular series, we had this graphic of this guy with this you know, gnarly tattooed and pierced tongue hanging out. And it's like he's drooling. It was, it was gross, but pretty cool. Uh, and it, it was all for visual effect. Um, and I don't know if this would interest you or not, but right after the service out here in the main connector, we're going to be doing tongue piercings. So if anybody's, anybody, nobody's interested in that, you're like, ah, I've got it, I'm done. You're weird, man. <laughs> hey, to each his own. If that's your thing, like, help yourself. I personally see no point in driving a piece of metal through your tongue, but whatever. That particular series, even though we called it tongue pierced, had nothing to do with tattoos or body piercings or modifications of any kind, but it was about living what I called a tongue-pierced lifestyle. You might think, well, what in the world is that? A tongue-pierced lifestyle was simply a way to refer to altering the way we use words, which in turn will ultimately alter the way we live our life. If we learn to control our words, control our tongue, it will have a profound effect on our life and our relationships. A tongue pierced lifestyle just comes by practicing and learning a better way to use words. And, and that's something, if we all do that, you talk about people taking notice. Right? If you think you're going to get a lot of attention by maybe... Uh, filling your body with tattoos or piercings or whatever, I mean, sure, that's going to catch people's eye. But you know what will have a greater impact and will cause people to wonder more about you as far as what's different about you? The use of your tongue. The words that you allow to come out of your mouth. Because, I mean, words, they're extremely powerful. I mean, I don't know that anybody in here would actually doubt that. There are some words and phrases in the English language that have profound effect, that, that invoke a lot of emotion when they're said. On the lower end of the scale, for example, if I were going to tell you a story this morning, and I started off with the words, once upon a time, that might immediately sort of take you back 
to your childhood, maybe you would start thinking about your favorite childhood story that your mom or dad or your grandparents would read to you on a regular basis, just once upon a time. Or if someone were to say, I love you. Those are three of the most powerful words in the English language. Just like on the other end of that spectrum would be the words, I hate you. I hope nobody in here is using those words. If you are, this is a good message for you. We shouldn't be using those kinds of words. Those are detrimental, hurtful words. And what about the words, I'm sorry? There's a lot of hurt. A lot of pain can be put to rest. Misunderstandings can be laid to rest with those simple words. Grace and forgiveness are extended when we use the words, I'm sorry. And you would probably add to that list some of your own, all of which would point to the same truth, that words are powerful and they have an extreme and profound effect on those around us. They can be used, and we'll get more into this in a moment, they can be used to build up or to tear down. So it's no wonder why the Bible has so much to say about the tongue, about how we use words and the impact that they have on people around us and how to control it, how to control what we say. And so there's a lot of scriptures we could go to, but we're going to go, first of all, to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. And when we did this series years ago, this was our theme verse. It's sort of like the memory verse for the series. And so even though we're not doing this particular series, I would really challenge you to maybe commit this to memory this week. Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Think about that for a moment. You've probably heard the old phrase, you reap what you sow. I think that verse right there is telling us, you'll reap what you say. That's the power of words. The writer here said, the tongue has the power. It possesses the power of life and death. The word for for power there is a word in the Hebrew language that means to control. It has the strength, or literally translated, is in the hand of. So life and death are in the hands of the tongue. The tongue has the ability to speak life, to add value to life, to increase life. But it also has the ability to diminish it, to devalue it, to destroy it. Death and decay are in the life, are in the, are in the tongue. Words of whether it's criticism, negativity, or even going more extreme, words of hate, words of violence, we declare war around the world with words. On the other end of the spectrum are words that give life, words of encouragement, words of of hope and comfort and celebration. So the big question today is how are we using our words? And what kind of impact and influence are they having on our life and the lives and world around us. And and I don't want to miss this opportunity. It's probably something that I wouldn't have mentioned, per se, back in 2011 because it wasn't quite as big a deal then, but we need to consider and take into account the virtual world of words now. Talking about social media, our interaction online, whether it's, you know, Twitter Instagram, Facebook, whatever platforms you might be using, emails between one another, all of those are full of words. And we must guard those words as carefully as the ones that come out of our mouth. We were, I was just talking with someone after the first service. And you know, he and I, from a different you know, earlier generation, just like several of you in here, that wasn't a thing for us growing up. You know, we, we didn't have to think about or even worry about how we used words online. There was no online 
except the clothes hanging out back, you know. That was the only thing online. But see, like in my day, unlike this generation who is uh, constantly tempted, and it's made very easy, by the way, to say whatever they want to say while sitting behind a computer screen or on a phone. Like in my day, if you wanted to say something, you had to say it out loud into somebody's face. Well, see, there were sometimes direct consequences to that. You know, you had planned in your mind that I'm going to say this and these things are going to happen. You see, uh, Mike Tyson once said that everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> See, then the plan changes. See, that's the world I grew up in. Hey, say what you want, but there may be some very direct and harsh consequences to follow. A lot of that's been removed. And, and, and we feel like we have some, some right or freedom. Just say whatever we want to say. Again, online, we need to guard that. And remember the powerful effect of words. So the overall goal of today's message is simply to to elevate us, to bring us to a higher level of consciousness when it comes to how we use our words, to challenge us to strive to use as many words as possible that would honor God, that would bring Him glory, that that would show love and appreciation and respect for other people rather than words that would hurt God or hurt others. Now, I don't mean that we need to just go around and try to to fill our vocabulary with more religious-sounding words and church cliches. That's really not helpful. What I'm talking about is, is choosing words more carefully, more wisely. Choose words that have a positive impact on those around us and reflect our love for God. So, if we would do that, just imagine the profound and positive effect it might have on our life. Everything, everything could potentially change for the better if we simply began to choose better words. Now, if that's something you're interested in, then take down three truths here about our words that we need to consider. Number one, that words are a gift from God. I don't know if you've thought about this very much, But words are what created the world. Everything around us in creation exists because of words. You go back to Genesis chapter 1. The beginning of the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's a general statement. And from there the writer begins to get into a little more of the details. Well, what took place during this creation process? How did God create the heavens and the earth? Verse 3 begins with the first creative day. And you know how it begins? And God said. Every creative day in Genesis begins with those same words. And God said. All that exists in creation exist because of words. I mean, it goes without saying, but God's words are pretty powerful, aren't they? God's words are what brought the world, the universe, the places we have yet to discover into existence. God's words are creative. In Romans, Paul says, God spoke of things that are not, and guess what? They came to be. That's incredibly powerful. But at the same time, God's words can also destroy. An example of this is Revelation chapter 19 where John is describing a time in the future when Christ's enemies will rally against him. They will oppose him and make war with him. But John says that Christ will come on a white horse, his army will be with him, and a sharp sword will protrude from his mouth with which he will destroy the nations. Well, what John is describing is not a literal sword coming out of the mouth of Jesus, but it's a depiction, a description of the powerful words that he will use. 
He won't, he won't need an arsenal of weapons. All he will need is words. And he will destroy his enemies. With words, God creates. He gives life. With words, God destroys and brings about death. Now, I want you to think back again to Genesis chapter 1. This is where things become very personal. Chapter 1, verse 26 of Genesis says, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. God says, let's make mankind and let him reflect us. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So as God's creation, we reflect and we have many of the same attributes and the abilities of God. One of those is the ability to speak. Nothing else in all of creation has the ability to use words like mankind. It's a great gift. But with this gift comes an awesome responsibility because Obviously, to a much lesser degree, like God, we have the ability with our words to create, to give life, but also to destroy. So, certainly, we should choose them very carefully. And that brings us to the second truth to consider about the use of our tongue and our words. Words can build up or they can tear down. This is something that we've already been talking about mentioned here but but it's true words have the ability to to build us up to make more of us or to tear us down there's probably not a single person in this room who would have trouble remembering words that either encouraged you you know that gave you life or words that discouraged you words that hurt you if you can remember this little, uh, I guess you'd call it a nursery rhyme, just finish it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words will never hurt me. Who believes that to be true? No one? Right? I mean, if, if you're beyond kindergarten, you figured out that that's not true. Only part of it is true. Sticks and stones will hurt. But words do too. Words can be very painful. They tear us down. They can cut us. Words leave scars. It probably won't take but a moment, but think of the last time someone said something to you that was hurtful. When was the last time somebody said something critical to you, made some negative or snide remark toward or about you, when was the last time somebody said something that cut you deeply? Listen, it could have been 20 years ago, but I bet that wound is just as fresh and tender today as the day they said it. You don't forget those kinds of things, do you? What about words that help? Words that encourage? Words that build you up? When was the last time someone said something encouraging to you? That... When they said that, you, you just sort of felt life come into you. Maybe it was when you were in high school. And you were on the verge of quitting, dropping out. And some teacher or some administrator said something to you that caused you to once again believe in yourself. That helped you realize that you have purpose. I mean, the, the words that that Jill was just saying this morning as we started our service. You know, that, that we have value and, and that God has, has gone to great lengths to design each and every single one of us in a very special way. And those are life-giving words. Those are words that perhaps someone came in here today needing to hear. Because there have been other words that people have spoken to you this week that have caused you to question that. Maybe there were parents or grandparents in your life that, that spoke words of wisdom to you and, and godly counsel. How have those words changed the course of your life? 
That's the power of the tongue. So number three, this could also be said, that words determine quality of life. This is something I really want us to ponder this week. To to go back and think about again and again and again. How do our words, whether they're spoken, written, whether they're typed, or simply thought, that's one we can't miss. We think using words, right? So they still matter. We still need to guard the words that we think. How do those words affect our life? and our relationships, and the lives of those around us. For example, if you're always sort of being degrading, speaking negatively, critically about or towards other people, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your children, maybe it's your parents, or your siblings, or your co-workers, if you're constantly saying or thinking negative words toward or about them, don't be surprised when your relationship with those people stink. If you want better relationships, choose better words. We reap what we say. That's true in every area of our life, in every relationship in our life. Also true in our relationship with God. The words that we use and how often we use them will have a direct effect on the quality of our relationship with God. And I'm not saying that, again, you have to use some embellished, religious-sounding words, pray these these really prolific, pious-sounding prayers in order to have a right and good relationship with God. That's not it at all. It's much simpler than that. What I'm saying is that we, if we don't communicate with God regularly, how do we do that? Through prayer, using words. If that's not a regular part of our life, then the quality of our life, both physically and spiritually, is going to suffer. The power of words. These are some truths. These aren't my opinions. These aren't, these aren't just things that I've experienced personally, though I have, I think these are biblical truths about words, that they are a gift from God, they have the power to build up, the power to tear down, and they also would determine the quality of our life. So by now we should be beginning to understand, to see the importance of choosing our words wisely. We're beginning to To see the power, unrivaled power that words have. And so the next question then is how can we harness that power in such a way to use it constructively, in a positive way rather than destructively? The tongue has in its hands the power of life and death. So how do we harness that power to bring about life? If you wanted to do some extra study this week, I would challenge you to go to James chapter 3. James 3, it's in toward the end of the New Testament, is like the classic passage on the use and the power of the tongue. And James reminds us there in chapter 3 that the tongue has great power, but often it's out of control. Now think about that for a moment. What happens typically when something has a lot of power, but that power gets out of control? A lot of damage typically happens. Things get broken. People get hurt. And so we want to avoid those kinds of scenarios. So we need to keep that power in control. That means choosing our words, harnessing its power, to bring God glory and to do good to help build up others. So with a few minutes we have left, let me give you five tips on achieving that goal. If you want to stick with the, with the pun today, this would be five tips of the tongue. All right, five tips of the tongue. Number one, practice starting your day with praise. 
Practice starting your day with praise. I want you to think for a moment how your typical day begins. Most of us in here, we have a routine. We get up every morning and we do the same set of things. Maybe you get up and you watch some news or you have a cup of coffee. You may start your day with a nice shower or some exercise. Maybe you spend some quiet time alone doing some sort of devotional or prayer time. You might put on some music. But most of us in here have some sort of routine that we go through. And have you ever noticed that when something in that routine gets out of whack or changes, something interrupts our routine, it really has an effect on the rest of the day? If something goes wrong with that routine in the morning, it's almost as if the rest of the day goes from bad to worse. It, It just throws the whole thing off. It's like... Our morning routine is the rudder of a ship. It sets the course of the day. Now with that morning routine in mind, I want you to go a little deeper and think about what are some of the first words that you typically speak on a normal day? What are some of the words that you first think on a typical day? Is it about how you dread getting up and going to work because you're not having a real good relationship with somebody at work and so you just really would rather stay at home? You see, how we, what we say and what we think sort of sets the tone. Think about it this way, and those of you with kids would totally understand this. What does your morning sound like? You're like, oh my gosh. Sounds like a herd of elephants, you know, stampeding through my house. But what what words are being used at home in the morning? Do you wake up yelling at the kids because they left a pile of dishes in the sink after you went to bed? I mean, maybe it's warranted. But but do you see how that kind of, of those kinds of words sort of can set the day? I'd be willing to bet that how our day begins determines how it ends. What we do, what we say, what we think in the morning sets the course for the rest of the day. So what I'm saying here is just consider starting your day with praise. Well, what does that mean? Praise is simply honoring, glorifying, extolling God for His attributes, for who He is taking time to reflect on the goodness, the kindness, the favor of God, the mercy of God, the patience of God, and complimenting Him, if you will. Starting our days with, with, again, what we sang a few minutes ago, with gratitude, gratefulness, and thanksgiving in our heart. God, thank you. Not everything in my life is, is right, but God, you are right. You are good. The psalmist wrote this, Psalm 145, verse 2, Every day... I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. If you don't mind writing in your Bible, or you can highlight it on your Bible app, I would circle the day, uh, the words every day. Every day I will praise you. Harnessing the power of the tongue in such a way that it positively affects our life requires starting every day, every day with praise. Not just some days. Not just occasional days and not just days that sound like Sundays. Every day begins with praise. Number two, offer words of encouragement to others daily. There's that word again, daily. You see how this has to become a regular practice? It has to become a part of our life every single day. Now we're shifting our focus towards using words that encourage and build others up and Granted, that may be more difficult for some than it is for others because, really, encouragement is a spiritual gift. It doesn't mean that the rest of us don't have the ability to encourage others. It just means that for some, it's going to come a little easier than for others. But we can all do it, and we all have to do it. It's important that we 
practice encouraging, saying things that bless others. Why? Well, not only because it's going to make the one being encouraged feel good, it's going to give life to them, but we're going to find a blessing in it too. Haven't you noticed that when you say something that you know is going to make someone else feel good or be encouraged that you get encouraged by it? Like there's something, it does something in you and you feel good because you know that now they feel good. But I've run into a few people that, you know, have a problem with a sour attitude, sort of a pessimistic perspective about others who say they, well, I just live by the motto, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. Well, there may come a time and instances where that's appropriate. But to me, that kind of mindset, that kind of approach to how we interact and relate to others is indicative of a heart problem. If I cannot find, if I cannot bring myself to say something positive to or about someone else, the problem's not with them. The problem's with me. It's a heart problem. Because Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 34, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. If I cannot speak something positive, something encouraging, something life-giving, that means there's nothing in my heart that resembles that. You see, that's a problem. That's not Christ-like. That does not reflect the character and nature and love of God in any way. So we need to look a little deeper if we struggle to encourage others. Now you might say, well, okay, who do I encourage? Who needs encouragement? How do I recognize people who need to be encouraged? It's very easy. Just look around. Everybody in here, everybody at work, everybody who lives under your roof, even strangers that you pass by throughout the week, we all have one thing in common. We need and want to be encouraged. You might think, well, I don't know. I I know some folks that sort of live with a persistent scowl on their face. They, They look like they're chewing on a lemon all day long. They especially need it. And they may not admit it, but they want it. It makes you feel good when someone says something that breathes life into you. One of the, one of the easiest ways to serve other people. You know, we talk about serving. And sometimes we, we sort of get off course and we think, you know, in, in a way to, to serve somebody... We, we have to go to some foreign land and, or, or we've we got to be involved in some kind of great project or maybe we have to spend a certain amount of money and all these things. But, but it's much easier than that. We can serve people. And we can show our love for God and our love for people simply by speaking kind words, life-giving words. All you have to do is just understand the power that are in those words. And here's something for us to take home. This is not a suggestion. To use words to encourage others regularly on a daily basis is is not something that I'm saying to you, this is what we should do. Or in a world where everything is right, this is what we would do. No. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, encourage one another daily. So long as it is called today. You see, I didn't see anywhere in there that it said, encourage one another daily if you feel like it. Or if you're having a good day. Or if you're getting along with them. Or if you like what they did or said to you yesterday. Encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. There's an opportunity to encourage other people. And that opportunity comes with every sunrise. Don't miss it. Number three, this is a difficult one. This is big. Work to remove all inappropriate words from your speech. This is that one where you were hoping that I just wouldn't say it. 
because we give ourselves a lot of slack when it comes to, to things that we say that might be deemed inappropriate. Listen, I'm not pointing the finger here. I'm guilty as well. I've never been one to, to use foul language, you know, as they say, to cuss like a sailor or anybody else. I, I don't do that. I, I try to certainly to avoid going around and, and t- telling inappropriate jokes. But I am certainly, certainly guilty of my fair share of saying things that anybody might consider to be inappropriate. Unbecoming of a pastor or, uh, or a Christ follower, whatever. Do I give myself grace? Well, certainly. <laughs> Don't we all? I mean, yeah, I'm about grace. Our church is about grace. But at the same time, I think we need to be a little more sensitive. A little more conscious about the things we allow to come out of our mouths. Again, whether it's the jokes we tell, the comments we make, the things we insinuate. Because at the risk of sounding legalistic here, I think the Bible instructs those who desire to walk closely with Jesus to watch closely what they say. If we want to walk closely with Jesus, we need to watch closely what we say. To have pure speech. What's pure speech? Speech, words, that no matter who hears them, no matter who hears them, they would be deemed appropriate for the man or woman of God, for the follower of Christ. And now I'm not saying that if using foul language is a weakness of yours and that's something that you struggle with, that you're any less of a Christian or that God loves you less than anybody else, that's not true. I mean, let's think about Peter for a second. Peter was a cusser right up until Jesus was betrayed. Now, should we use that as an excuse to allow that kind of language to be a part of our life? Well, of course not. But we are works in progress. And sometimes this work of weeding out unworthy language takes considerable time. I've, I've even seen of late people wear T-shirts. This is almost as if they're boasting about it. But wear T-shirts that say, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. And like, I can snicker at that. I get the joke. But I think it's shameful. It's not really funny. You know why? Because from my experience, and I think this experience is based upon biblical truth, the closer a person gets to Jesus, the fewer words they will use that would cause him to blush. The closer we get to Jesus, the fewer things we're going to say that would cause him to blush. In 1904, there was a great revival that swept across Wales. You can read about it. It's called the Welsh Revival. Over 100,000 people gave their life to Christ during this time. It had a profound effect on the population at large, but lasting effects on a particular group of individuals was just really interesting. It was said that many of those who worked in the coal mines, after hearing the gospel, gave their lives to Christ. And then when they went back to the coal mines, production in the mines virtually stopped. You might wonder, why would one thing, the giving of their life to Christ, affect production in the coal mines? Well, the coal miners had a habit of using a lot of foul language. They, they cussed a lot. You know, in their days, it wasn't people cussed like sailors. It was people cussed like coal miners. And in their directives, their commands for the horses, they would use this language. But all the coal miners, after they met Christ, they stopped cussing. And guess what? The horses didn't understand what they were saying. They no longer would, would respond to the commands Because they were used to hearing the coal miners' foul language. That was just a part of it. And so they stopped. Work came to a halt. It just proves 
that when we harness our tongue, it can literally stop people, even horses, in their tracks and wonder like, what the heck's going on here? When we don't use the same language that everybody else in the office uses, we don't tell the same jokes that everybody else tells, when we don't laugh when everybody else laughs, it will have an impact. People are going to stop and notice. Here's a fourth tip. Strive to listen more than you speak. We've probably all heard the phrase, God gave you two ears and one mouth so you'd listen twice as much as you speak. I don't know if that's actually true, why he did that. But you get the point. It does support the idea that we should listen more than we talk. It's important that we learn what to say, when to say it, how to say it, and when not to say it. There's times we should just stay quiet. Now, somebody might say, you know, now you're being a little contradictory. You know, five minutes ago, you were saying if we stay quiet, then there's something wrong in our heart. Now you're saying that we should stay quiet. So which is it? Well, five minutes ago, we were talking about offering encouragement, speaking a blessing, That is not something that we should avoid. That is not something that we should keep to ourselves. But there are other things that we just need not say. And sometimes just our habit of talking for no reason or purpose at all should be avoided. That's called verbosity. Anybody in here know someone who just seems to talk and talk and talk? And they, I mean, they talk for no reason at all. They talk just to hear themselves talk. We know people like that. If you don't know someone like that, you are that person. So just be quiet. Give everybody else a chance. But here's what the Bible says about talking too much. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. When words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. We get ourselves in trouble when we talk too much and think or listen too little. James chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Maybe you were like me. You know, in school, I got in a lot of trouble. Not because I was a bad kid, but because I like to talk too much. And I I mean, I just say, hey, I'm gifted. You know, that's what God, you know, created me to do. I talk. But what we're seeing here is that the Bible says there's great wisdom and there's great opportunity to learn. There's sin to be avoided if we just listen a little more and talk a little less. Tips of the tongue. Number five, and this one is not in any way least of all being the last. This is where maybe some of us need to begin today. This needs to be the first step. Give your whole life to God. This is the central issue. Any improvement that's going to be made in the way we use our words or, or any improvement in any area of our life begins when we give our whole life to God. Let's stop this compartmentalization of life. God, I'm going to give you this part now, and then maybe later I'll give you this part of my life, and sometime down the road when I'm ready, I'll give you this part. No. Just go all in, put it all on the table, and push it to his side and say, that's all I got, God. Everything that, that is me, Every nook and cranny of my life is yours. I'm giving you all my life, not just the parts that make up my life. See, we've clearly seen this morning that there is a clear and close connection between the words that come out of our mouths and the status or the condition of our heart. I'm talking about that control center of our life. The Bible teaches us that if that control center, if our heart is full of blessing and full of life, full of goodness, full of love, full of honor, 
then we are going to speak life. We're going to speak a blessing. We're going to speak words that are honorable, that are respectable. But if our heart is full of cursing, full of criticism and negativity, if our heart is full of hatred, eventually those things will come out of our mouth. Reminding us again of what Jesus said. He repeated himself, Matthew 12, and then again in Matthew 15, verse 18. The things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. I'm sure there have been times when we've said something and surprised ourselves and thought, oh, where did that come from? It came from here. It came from our heart. Society didn't cause us to say it. People around us didn't force us to say that or to think that. That was what was in our heart. Good or bad, that's where it comes from. And so if the words that we use, the words that we think, come from our heart, the question then today is, what is it saying about us? What is that saying about our relationship with God? What does that say about the condition of our heart? Do those words clearly indicate that we are following closely with Christ? Or is it sending another message? Are those words saying there's work to be done? There's some heart issues that need to be addressed. Listen, don't underestimate the power of words. With every head bowed and every eye closed. This is what I want our prayer to be today. It's nothing extravagant. Very simple. But yet very challenging and profound. You may have heard someone say, you know, pray the word of God. Pray the scripture. Let these words that come straight from the pages of God's word be your prayer today. God Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. God, that's our prayer today. And for that to come into reality, for that to be so, many of us need to begin by just giving our whole life to you. By surrendering our lives to you, by trusting you as our Lord and our Savior about allowing you to forgive us of our sin and and cleanse us of our unrighteousness, as your word says. But no matter where we're starting today, no matter how much improvement needs to be made, our prayer is, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next week.